There's another facet of Marshall's criticism of the book that I think really uh, bears analysis. Uh, he claims that these genetic regulatory networks could be rewired so that they would control the expression of other pre-existing genes in a different way and cause uh, the new animal form to arise. The problem with that criticism is that we know empirically that when these genetic regulatory networks are perturbed, when they're changed, invariably what happens is that animal development shuts down. This is something that developmental biologists have discovered as they have performed experiments on actual animals during the process of animal development. As they alter those genetic regulatory circuits, as they perturb the core elements of that circuitry, invariably what happens is that animal development shuts down, the developing animals die. Now if an animal dies, evolution terminates at that point, there's no more evolution. And this has long been understood to be a problem, and it's a problem that I discussed in the book at, at, at great length. If you need a new, uh, if you need a, a, a developmental gene regulatory network to produce a new animal form, and if the evolutionary idea is that you would get one animal form arising from another, that means you would have to change one developmental gene regulatory network into another developmental gene regulatory network to produce a new form of animal life. But if it is also the case that perturbing a developmental gene regulatory network will necessarily cause it to shut down, to, it will cause the destruction of animal development and the termination of the evolutionary process. How do you ever get from one animal form to another? How do you ever change one developmental gene regulatory network to another one? This has been a problem that's been well noted by leading developmental biologists. And it's one of the problems that I present as a challenge to the efficacy of the neo-Darwinian mechanism. Marshall simply ignores that challenge and says, hey, in the pre-Cambrian times, things would have been different and these developmental gene regulatory networks could have been perturbed, they could have been altered. But we have no evidence for that. In fact, all the experimental evidence that we have runs exactly counter to his claim. And so what he actually ends up doing is reversing or, or, or uh, ignoring one of the key methodological principles of historical scientific reasoning. Historical scientific reasoning, as pioneered by Lyell and Darwin and, and has, has been used throughout the 20th, 20th and 21st century says that the present is the key to the past. The, the cause and effect relationships, the causal processes that we see at work today are the ones that would have been at work in the past. And what we know about the limitations of those processes are also things that we can assume were limitations in the past. So what we know best from experience is that developmental gene regulatory networks in the present do not permit alteration. They can't be perturbed without destruction to the organism and to the developing animal. But what Marshall does is he disregards that knowledge that we have from present experience and simply says it must have been different in the past. Why must it have been different? Because evolutionary theory requires it. That, but evolutionary theory is our historical theory about what happened a long time ago. We're supposed to base our historical theories on what we know takes place in the present. And he reverses that priority and says what we think must have happened in the past should alter our understanding of what we know does happen in the present. What we know does happen in the present is this. You perturb a developmental gene regulatory network, the developing animal shuts down. He disregards that knowledge and asserts that the opposite took place in the past in blatant uh, 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 repu blatantly, therefore, repudiating the, the imperatives of the historical scientific method.